MedCram.com. Welcome to another MedCram video. And as it turns out, the 100th update on COVID-19. We started doing coronavirus updates in late January, and here we are about six months later. So today we're going to update you on what is going on in the world of COVID-19. We're going to do a little retrospective, and we'll have a little something different at the end. First, let's look at the numbers. So in the United States, daily new cases have gone up and reached a high plateau. Daily deaths in the United States were decreasing until early July, and those seem to be ticking up. In California, daily new cases continue to rise, as do the daily deaths here in California. And I can tell you I work in both San Bernardino and Riverside counties in Southern California, and we have definitely noticed an increase in the hospitalizations for COVID-19. Whereas you look at New York, and daily new cases seem to have been kept successfully at a minimum. If we look at cases around the world, Brazil is certainly up there, and their daily new cases are increasing. And the number of new deaths in Brazil on a daily basis is steadily at a constant beat. And we can see some of the other countries that meet that list at the top. In addition to the United States and Brazil, we also have India, Russia, South Africa, Mexico, and Peru. In terms of treatment for COVID-19, there's been a new treatment that has been released in terms of press release and has been picked up by a number of agencies. And this is interferon beta in its inhaled form. This medication has been around for some period of time. It's a known medication that can help with the immune system. And it's been looked at in asthma for some period of time in terms of helping asthmatics fight infections. And this New York Times article kind of gets into the basic components of what's going on here. As we've talked about before in a number of our videos and updates, that it seems as though this virus tends to suppress the body's immune system, at least at the beginning. And they note that here in this article. They say here that scientists have found that the coronavirus attacks the body in part by blocking its natural interferon response disarming cells that would otherwise be alerting neighboring cells to activate their own genes and fortify themselves against the invading virus. And they're saying here that administering this interferon to patients would invigorate its defenses in the early stages of the illness. So the company that makes this has done a study that they registered, as you're supposed to do, on a clinical website, and they have just released some of the results of that research. And as a publicly traded company, the stock rules in the UK require them to release the data on this, but we don't have a peer-reviewed or even a preprint of the data at this point. And when that becomes available, we'll certainly pass that along to you. But let's at least see what they are saying at this point about this medication, interferon. So in this study, they took 101 patients and they randomized them to this interferon treatment that is nebulized or diffused into the air as they breathe it in. It's called a nebulizer treatment. And their code name for this was SNG001 versus placebo. And so they randomized these patients to either this inhaler or the placebo. And according to the press release, when they looked at discharge from the hospital, the average time to discharge in the intervention group was six days, and in the placebo group, it was nine days. When they looked at the odds of recovery at 28 days, they found that those in the intervention group had a 3.86 times odds of recovery at 28 days than the placebo. When they looked at the odds of either death or ending up on the ventilator, they found that there was only one-fifth as compared to placebo. And then finally, they looked at the odds of complete recovery. That means no viral symptoms at all afterwards, no long haulers, no nothing. So what was the odds of complete recovery? And they found that in the intervention group, there was 2.19 
times the odds versus placebo. And when they looked at the p-values for these, the p-value for this one here was 0.017. This one was 0.046. And this one was 0.007. So these were all statistically significant. We have the press release here, which we'll link to in the description section below, including the key findings and exactly who these professors are. Also, if you'd like some balance reaction in terms of experts talking about some of the shortcomings of this announcement, we'll also link to that here. This is the sciencemediacenter.org and some of the expert opinions that have looked at this release and have some questions about it as well. I think before it is ready for prime time, we're going to need to see peer-reviewed journal articles and probably a larger randomized controlled trial since this one only had about 100 subjects. So over the last few months, we've released 100 updates. And what I like to do is go over those and pick out what I think are videos that really talk about pivot points. Okay, coronavirus update number one. That's where we talked about what an RNA virus was, talked about the common cold, we talked about how it comes from animals, and that we think that there may be some close contact going on. Somehow I think historians will be looking back at not only these MedCram updates, but a lot of the videos that other people have posted to document what happened and what people were thinking during this time. It's also great to read a lot of your comments on these videos, especially over time and as time has changed things. I think one of my favorite sets of updates is 46 and 47, because we really get into the molecular biology. We get into the immune system, where we've talked about before how the innate immune system is crippled in this coronavirus. And we talked about a paper that was published out of a center of excellence in Indonesia that looked at SARS-1 and MERS and compared it to SARS-2, and they came up with the fact that the innate immune system particularly was going to be crippled, and that's exactly what we're seeing now with this emergence of beta interferon potentially working. Well, that led us down the whole idea of how do we enhance our immune system in this situation so we're not held under the spell, as it were, of COVID-19 and a suppressed immune system. And that led us to looking at immune enhancing objects. And one of those things was sleep. We also talked about a number of things. One of those things that we looked at was human monocyte stimulation by experimental whole body hyperthermia. And we reflected back on the Nobel Prize in Medicine winner in 1927 and that was Julius Wagner Yoreg, who basically infected patients on purpose with malaria so that he could increase their temperature. And this seemed to cure his patients of neurosyphilis. And we started looking at some of the data with hydrothermal therapy. Also started looking at some of the Nordic countries that do this on a regular basis with sauna bathing and looked at some of the data there related to that, and some interesting data showing that all-cause mortality improved with frequency of sauna bathing on a weekly, bi-weekly, tri-weekly basis. Another favorite, as I mentioned, was Update 47, where we started looking at what they were doing prior to drug randomized control trials, as we said, back in the 1920s and even before, and specifically during the epidemic of 1918-1919 with the flu. And so we at MedCram proposed, is there something that we could do between when we get the virus at home and when we show up to the hospital with symptoms of COVID-19, shortness of breath, hypoxemia? There seems to be about a seven-day period of time there between those two periods where maybe there is an opportunity to intervene and to prevent this from progressing. I still think that a forward-thinking scientist could come up with a nice study to test this hypothesis to see if there's something that we could do, something that is widely available, inexpensive, universal, that you wouldn't need a test for, that could reduce your chances of having to go to the hospital. 
And fortunately, I'm aware of several different centers across the country now that are investigating this very question. The next update that I thought was really practical, and I loved to share it with as many people as I could, is update 59. And basically, it was, what am I doing practically right now with the knowledge that I have and trying to share? What am I doing for me and my family to protect me as much as I possibly can from COVID-19? And this is pertinent because I'm a critical care intensivist. I'm walking in and out of patients' rooms all the time, which are known to have COVID-19. And so what am I doing to prevent that from myself getting infected and also infecting my family members, etc.? And so I love this because I can just send this video to people who ask me, well, what are you doing? And I can go through what I am doing, why I'm doing it. We even got into the routine that I do when I go to work and come back home to make sure that I don't take coronavirus home with me and into the house. MedCram 63 has got to be one of my favorites as well. After we started to hear that thrombosis was a big problem with COVID-19, we started looking at why that was the case. We started to see that there was thrombosis in autopsies, that they were platelet-rich, that there was quite a bit of von Willebrand's factor that was being expressed. And we started connecting the dots, and Update 63 did quite a bit of that, looking at oxidative stress and why patients are being admitted to the hospital with COVID-19 have high BMIs, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, renal problems. These are not the patients that we thought that would be ending up in the hospital. No, rather, we thought these patients that would be ending up in the hospital would be patients with lung disease or asthma. That turns out not to be the case as much as we used to think. And so what we did was we put together an understanding about what it is that we thought was going on. MedCram Update 65 and 66 connected those dots in terms of papers that we pulled out and looked at those things in vitro. We found that COVID-19 is the trifecta when it comes to increasing superoxide species and reactive oxygen species, both by what it does to angiotensin 2 and also by angiotensin 1-7, also by recruiting white blood cells that secrete superoxide. In MedCram Update 66, we developed that a little bit more, looked at ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and really set the stage for what we believe is going on and why oxidative stress is so important to understand when you're talking about who is susceptible to getting COVID-19. And I got to say, one of my favorite updates is MedCram 98. And this is where we took a look at this idea about adequate testing, which is far cheaper than the testing that we currently have and is far faster and probably more universal, potentially, to do so much better than what we currently have with our testing. And this idea has been spawned by Dr. Michael Mina out of the Harvard School of Public Health. And again, I want to thank This Week in Virology for picking up this idea and running with it. MedCram was sort of amplifier to that. But I'm happy to say that we've been able to get Dr. Michael Mina on with us in the first week of August, and so we'll be interviewing him, so stay tuned for that, because I think this idea really needs to get a lot more attention and has the ability to really change the thinking about what we need to do to get this country moving again and opening up in a logical way. So there we are. There is a small snippet of the almost 100 updates that we've done in the past. So tell us, which ones were your favorite? A number of healthcare providers went to our website, medcram.com, and took our free ventilator educational course, which is open to anyone who wants to do that. There is continuing medical education credit. There is maintenance of certification credit. And in the midst of all that we were doing to keep people updated on coronavirus through YouTube, we're also trying to manage our MedCram website as well. So if you like what you're seeing here, don't forget to support us at MedCram.com. So I promised you something different here at the end of our 100th episode. So I'm going to tell you something a little bit more about me than you might already know. And I don't want to seem like this one-dimensional person, like I'm a physician and all I talk about is coronavirus all day long, because I have so many other interests. 
One of those interests that I really, really love is music. I happen to play several instruments, and my favorite composer of all time, hands down, is Johann Sebastian Bach. So you can just imagine my glee when I came across this. So this is a video of Joshua Bell, who's a world-famous violinist. He decided to team up in synchrony with a number of other healthcare providers. He's not a healthcare provider himself. He's a world-famous violinist. But these are healthcare providers that are taking care of patients, COVID patients. And they're playing the famous Bach Double Violin Concerto. As you can see in the video, there's a number of healthcare providers, and they are highlighted as they get to their part in the piece. And it really highlights for me a number of things. Number one, that we're a team of many. And even when we're taking care of patients in the hospital, it's a team effort that does that. And I think that's embodied in this piece of music that Bach does so well at interweaving the melody and the harmony that everything we do, we do as a team. And that is shown here with the Bach Double Violin Concerto. The other thing that I'm gonna do is, yes, I'm gonna go ahead and link to a pretty old video, it's about 10 years old now, of me playing the Bach Toccata and Fugue in D minor on an organ in France at the Nantes Cathedral. And what is bittersweet about this is that this organ has just been destroyed by a fire just a couple of weeks ago in Nantes, France. The bittersweet thing about it as well is that this cathedral, while it was relatively untouched by the fire, the organ unfortunately was completely destroyed. The one part that I'm quite interested in, of course, is that part of this cathedral was designed by one of my ancestors many hundreds of years ago, who was an architect. And so this was a big highlight at the time, was to be able to play on this organ from 1611 in a cathedral that was started to be built back in the 14-1500s. The other gentleman there that's with me is my brother, who is helping me turn pages and also navigate the many stops on this huge organ. So I'll leave a link to that, and now you'll know a little bit more about me and my interests. We've had a hundred updates, and I don't know how many more updates we'll do. Hopefully, coronavirus simmers down. But so long as there is a development, we will have an update. Thanks for joining us.